Hey, First Assembly, this is Pastor Wass. I want you to grab a comfortable seat, get something to drink, and let's sit down and get into the Word of God. Hey man, listen, so good to be with you this evening. I want to thank you guys for tuning in and joining us on Wednesday night. And I want to encourage, if you're not uh, participating in a church or attending a church on Sundays uh, at 1030, please come back, check out our Facebook page, check out our YouTube channel, join us. Uh, for service. God has been so good and His Spirit is moving. We'd love to have you join us. And if you're watching tonight, please make sure you comment, hit like uh, on Facebook, hit subscribe on YouTube, comment, let us know that you're there. And if you have a prayer request, we would love to pray with you. And so please make sure you let us know. Um, we started last week a new series uh, called Heroes of the Faith. And we're going to be basing it all out of Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, and the list of the people that we find there. And just kind of dig down a little bit on their stories. Who are they? Um, how did God use them? What can we learn what God was doing then? How can we learn to apply that to our hearts and the truths of that to our lives today so that we might become uh, more like Him? And so, you know, we live in a day, and this is one of the things we've talked about, is that we live in a day that it's easy to talk about Jesus. Uh, it's easy to talk about faith. Um, but we had looked at an article that said 75% of people in America believe that there is a God or say they believe in God. But when you look at the, the state of the nation, when you look at the state of our communities and state of some families and state of some churches, that, that is that really what we see? Do we see people that 75% believe in God? And, and I don't think so. I, 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 don't, I don't see that when I look out. I think... Um, that a lot of this is based on people shaping Jesus, meaning I believe in Jesus, but I, I like this part and I don't like that part, so I'll ignore that. And, and not really following the Jesus of the Scripture and the Jesus of the Bibles, but ones that we have fashioned and ones that we have created. And in doing so, I think sometimes we live lives that are worshiping a man-made idea of God and not the Christ that is to be shaping our lives, our hearts. To serve Jesus is to lay your life down and to take up the cross. And the cross is never comfortable. Um, the cross always has weight to it. And what I mean by that is that there's never a time in my life that I should be unaware of the cross that I carry. It is to be the foundation of my life. And, and if I can be living and not be aware of the cross that I'm called to carry, then I think that something's wrong. Um, I think that something is amiss in our hearts. You know, if I'm a follower of Jesus, I should feel that everywhere that I go. And, and I don't think I, I, I think I don't think we should really see that so much as a, a burden, uh, so much as a, oh gosh, I got to carry my cross today. Not that type of thing, but rather uh, see it as an opportunity to share and, and to give what I have experienced in Christ. God has been good to me, uh, and it's not because I'm good. Uh, God has been good to me because He is good. And, and what I have experienced in Christ and, and know of Christ and what I hold of Him in my heart, I, I want others to experience and others to have. So it's a joy to carry that cross. It's a joy to, in every situation, in every circumstance, say, how can God use me here? How do I love here? You know, uh, what does love require of me? We've talked about that question a lot, you know, for that moment and in that thing. And so while we are in a season... You know, with COVID and everything, that everything has, has changed and nothing's as it used to be. I don't think that ever changes the, the call of us to carry our cross. God has not changed. His heart has not changed. And, and even though we've been through a lot of transition in the last 18 months, 19 months, the mission of God has not changed. And in and through it all, I believe that I can still walk in peace uh, because God is unchanging and it's God who holds my life. Uh, even if I feel in the midst of, you know, midst of storms, midst of struggles, God ultimately holds my life and I can have peace and that God is with me and God has me. And so I want to ask you, do you truly believe uh, that God has your life in this season? Um, do you truly believe that with what you're facing, what you're dealing with, what you're going through, that God has you? Uh, in this in this moment, and and that might seem like a silly season or a silly question because like, oh yeah, God's in control of everything. No, no, no. But 
Do you believe that personally for your heart? Do you believe that with what you're facing and what you're dealing with and what you're going through, that God has you? Because I believe if I truly believe that, that God has my life, then I'm going to be able to live in faith in any season. And when you look at Hebrews chapter 11, all the people that were listed there truly walked in faith in the seasons that they were in. And it doesn't mean they were perfect. Uh, they didn't walk perfectly. They, it doesn't mean they, they never made mistakes. It doesn't mean they always said the right thing or did the right thing. Some of them had major issues, major blow-ups, major problems. Some of them had a past. Others of them were adversaries of God in, in so many different ways. And there were some that lived so so contrary to the things of God and yet in a moment repented and turned and now we find them in the hall you know of faith and to me it is amazing and and encouraging and 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 is so because I just love the fact that it's just it's just never too late to turn to God uh, it's not a 25 and down you got to be the Lord's or he can't use you for the rest of your life it's never too late to turn to God I don't care how old you are I don't care where you are I don't care what the mess you're in I don't care how good you are at it or bad you are at it I'm telling you no matter where you are you can turn to the Lord today in this moment ask him to be the savior of your life father come and heal me and strengthen and be the savior of my life be the Lord of my life and I'm telling you from that moment on Things can change, God can move, and your story can continue to be written and have a completely different ending than you ever imagined because it's just never too late to turn to God. And one of the things that really stands out about the folks in Hebrews 11 is that when they did fall down, when they did mess up, they simply didn't stay down. They got back up and they kept moving forward. And so today, listen, if you can run, run. If you got to walk, walk. If all you can do is crawl, then my God, crawl. But stay moving and keep moving forward. And, and we look at how they lived by faith in their lives as a norm and not an exception. And, and I think that's a big thing. I think we've all had times that we kind of felt hopeless or, or tied to something, stuck in a situation. And the only thing that we could do was trust God and God came through. And in that moment or in that season, we go, whew, I really had to live by faith. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think God wants us to go from a moment we had to live by faith to me not living by faith. And then, oh, there's another moment. I've got to start living by faith again. I think God wants us every day, each day and every day, to live by faith, to walk in that faith. And when he's talking about living by faith, he's not just talking about in the moments where we reach the end of ourselves, but he's talking about waking up in the morning and starting my day at that place of I trust God and I believe that God is faithful. And so I'm going to live in obedience and live in faith every single day. You see, when it comes to being a follower of Christ, if I'm not living in faith, then I'm not living right. The right way is to live in faith. And to read all the stories that we're going to get into and, and just grow in our knowledge but not grow in our application is to fall short and to miss the greater point. It's amazing that God used them. I mean, it's amazing that God did what he did in their lives. And it's amazing that God can do that in your life if you're willing to walk by faith. The power isn't for you and I that God did that 2,000 years ago. The power of those stories and of chapter 11 of Hebrews is that God can do that in you today. God can do that in you in your moment and in your situation and in your lion's den and in your fiery furnace. The same God, the same spirit, the same power is at work today in you if you will walk by faith. Now Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the confidence of what we hope for, assurance of what we do not see. See, faith in order to be faith, and, and, and that's God talking about, has to have uh, substance. It's not just... I just feel like it's all going to work out. You know, it, it, it's not that. It's not wishful thinking. It's not hocus pocus that we're just going to wake up one day and everything's just going to be good. It's, it's I have faith in God to make a way. It's not a goosebump. It's not an emotion or feeling. Faith is being sure of something that you're hoping for and believing with confidence that it is going to come to pass. And this is what helps you to hold on. Uh, this is what helps you in times when the wind's really blowing and the storm's really raging and the boat's really rocking. This is what helps hold you in times when you feel like everything is being shaken because I believe that God will find and make a way. I believe that it will come to pass. In spite of what I see and in spite of what I feel, I trust God first and foremost. And we said this at Christmas every year, you know, children have faith. 
The Santa's going to come down the chimney and eat the cookies and drink the milk and put presents under the tree. And, and they think they're going to wake up on Christmas morning and run down there and there's the gifts going to be. And we could have all the faith in the world, but there's no substance to Santa. Uh, they put their trust in something that doesn't exist. If it wasn't for a mom and dad who went out, bought the stuff, wrapped the stuff, put the stuff under the tree after the kids went to bed, then that would not happen. It doesn't work like that. It wouldn't be there in the morning. Now, some of us, uh, in our lives, we've got very deep-rooted hurts. Um, and most of the time, guys, it's because we put faith in things that could only let us down with time. We misplaced our faith. We put faith in stuff that let us down. And so if you are wanting your faith to grow, if you're wanting your faith to become more, put it in something that won't let you down. And I want to say today, put your faith in, in God. Put your faith in God. God has shown and proven time and time and time again. He is faithful and God will not bail on you. You know, faith is acting like God is telling you the truth and then you acting like what he says is true. Uh, it's moving in it. It's believing it to the point of action. It's not just talking about it, but it's acting on it. James 2.17 says, In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. You know, faith isn't faith until it makes its way down to your feet, is what we said last week. So until we're ready and willing to act on what we believe, then nothing concrete really is going to shape and happen in our lives. Because faith isn't just believing, it's acting on it. It's putting your faith in God and being obedient. Uh, you know, Peter never would have walked on water if he didn't have faith to swing his feet over the side of the boat and to step out on the water and walk. God will give you what you need, but sometimes he waits for you to take that first obedient step. And I want to tell you, some of you have been waiting for God to move and waiting for God to move and waiting for God to move. My question to you is this, have you been obedient to what God has asked of you? Because my obedience releases God in my moment. My obedience, when God says, Wes, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'm a move, I'm powerful, I'll do this, but will you? When I say yes, then it's like God just unleashes. And so faith and action are tied together um, all the time. And in your life, you've got to decide kind of who you want to please. Uh, am I going to go through my life and please God? Or am I going to go through my life and please man? And you ask somebody, you know, that question in the context of church, it's a very easy answer because we know the scripture. You know, hey, you don't want to live your life trying to please man. You never can. We want to please God. But here's the thing. The world is always pushing us to please man. Uh, the world is always pushing us to have that agenda. The world is always pushing us uh, to do that thing. But, but when I hear God and believe God and obey God, I receive the approval uh, of God. And, and I think that's more than anything that, that at the end of the day, at the end of my race, I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to hear, Wes, you ran the race. Uh, you moved when I said move and you stood when I said stand and you were quiet when I said be quiet. You acted in faith and you were obedient to what I spoke to your life. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Romans chapter 3 verses 21 to 26 says, But now God has shown us a way to be right with him without keeping the requirements of the law that was promised in the writing of Moses and the prophets long ago. We're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned, We've all fall, uh, we all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God, in His grace, freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. The sacrifice shows that God was being fair when He held back and he did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. righteousness for he himself is fair and just. And he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. I love this because there's no time limit to this scripture. There's no time limit on, on what we have done uh, in our past that renders us as unusable. We all have sinned. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. But the truth is God isn't done with any of us. Our story is still being written and I want that to be hope to you today. And so in faith I pray over my life. 
And in faith, I speak over my life. I speak to what I can't see, but I speak to what I believe will be in time, and I will see it because my God is good. And so I want to ask you tonight, sitting at home, watching, uh, what, what are things that you would want to speak into your life tonight? Uh, what would you speak in your life in faith? You know, take a minute and think about that. Instead of just wishing things were better, what do you want better, and how can we pray that? How can we pray that in a way that brings us into alignment with what God is asking of us and what God desires of us, but it also brings us into alignment to receive from God what we're believing for? Take a minute and, and do that right where you are, right in this moment. What am I speaking in faith over my life? And document that. Write that down. Let that be a foundation of what you pray. And I'm not talking, again, about wishful thinking or blab it and grab it, but what are you believing God for in your life? I think it's a great question uh, to ask. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever lived in a place uh, near a large body of water in the winter. I grew up, we had uh, ponds, and, and we would fish in ponds. And sometimes during the winter, it would get cold enough that you could kind of go out and ice skate on the pond and, uh, and, and whatnot. And, you know, we would always take a, an axe or something and chop a hole and make sure the ice was thick. But if you've ever had to walk on a frozen pond, there's this, it's kind of a creepy feeling, um, really. I mean, you're kind of walking out there, and you're, you're taking the steps, you're being very cautious, and you kind of... You're listening because you don't want to take that step and just hear the, the ice underneath your feet kind of spider web where it just kind of cracks and you just, you know, kind of hear it rustling. You're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And then you slowly are trying to move and, and whatnot like that. And I know that there can be concerns and little thoughts if you were to do that on the back of your mind. But here's the thing. What if before you were going to walk out on a, a frozen lake and you were nervous about it, but you saw a truck come down and drive across the pond right in front of you and then go up the other side, would you feel better or worse about that? Would you look and go, well, good grief. If a truck can go on it, then I can go on it. I think it would make it easier for me if I saw a truck drive across a frozen pond and go up the other hill and they said, hey, Wes, will you walk across the frozen pond? Yeah, absolutely I will. Because if it can hold a truck, I know that it can hold me. If you see something bigger and heavier than you do it, all of, of course you're going to feel better about making that trip yourself. Well, that doesn't just apply to walking on frozen lakes or frozen ponds. That applies to people who have frozen feet. And sometimes are afraid to walk in faith. You see, to live in faith, we need to embrace a key thing. We've got to embrace something of seeing that God's done it with others. God can do it with me. And one of the ways that we build our faith so that when my moment comes, when I wake up and God says, will you live by faith with me today, that I say yes and embrace it is through worship. And that's the first thing we're going to look at tonight. Hebrews chapter 4 says this, by faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offspring, and by faith Abel still speaks even though he is dead. His message still carries on. Well, what was the message of Abel? And it was about true worship. You may know the story. There were two brothers, Cain and Abel, and Abel was a shepherd and Cain was a farmer, and they both made offerings to God, and Abel's was received and Cain's wasn't. Abel's offering was different. Now, most of the time when we think worship, we think a lot of different things. We think song and music and maybe dance or, or you may have this, you know, idea of even, you know, old hymns versus contemporary, you know, however it was. But here's the thing you've got to understand. The Word gives us a picture of what true worship looks like in the story of Abel. Worship is really how you live your life in a way that it honors God. And we're giving us this picture in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says this, So dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that He's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He'll find acceptable. This is, the tr this is truly the way to worship Him. See, worship isn't just about showing up and singing a couple of songs. Worship isn't just about having a devotion in the morning. Worship is so much broader than just the box that we put it in. Worship is the visible and verbal recognition of God for who He is, for what He has done, and for what we are trusting Him to do. And so I want to ask you, is your life a holy and living sacrifice to God. You see, worship is such a powerful thing in the life of a believer that it shouldn't shock us that one of the first things that God deals with in the hall of faith is true worship. And He gives us someone who modeled for us how to worship God. 
Now we know the story of Abel. We know that he was killed by his brother Cain. It wasn't an argument. It wasn't something that he had done to Cain. He was killed because he worshiped God in a way that pleased God and he was killed for true worship. And you find their story in Genesis chapter 4. They grew up in a Christian home, Adam and Eve. I mean, they had walked with God in the cool of the evening. They had sinned, ate the fruit, got kicked out of the garden. They had two kids. And so these, these you know, Cain and Abel grew up in a, in a home that, that understood faith and understood the presence of God and, and whatnot, walking in the cool of the evening. So Cain and Abel learned how to worship. But you look at Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 to 5, it says, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Both brought an offering, but only one pleased God. Let me ask you something. Why can't I please God by just showing up? Because sometimes we live like that. God, I'm, you should be glad I'm here. God, I was tired, but I got up and came to church on Sunday. You should be glad I'm here. God, you know what? Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, I recorded The Bachelor. I could be watching that, but I'm not. I'm watching Pastor West on First AG TV, Wednesday Word, and you should, I, you should be glad that I showed up. Why is me showing up not enough? Why was Cain's offering rejected? Here's the thing. It is very possible to show up at church and have it not benefit you. Uh, it is possible to show up at church or your small group or your Bible study uh, or your Sunday school class or your personal time of devotion and have your worship rejected. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I asked you this question, is my worship pleasing to God? Is my worship pleasing to God? We come in and go, oh, I like that song. I didn't like that song. And this one was too fast and that one was too slow. I could, it was too loud. It was too quiet. Slides weren't right. Worship was good or bad based on how it made me feel. And I challenge you and just said, what if our worship is about how did God receive my worship today? How did my worship make God feel today? Was God pleased? Was God honored? Was he you know, lifted up? Was he you know, elevated in my worship? And is my worship pleasing to God? Because scripture says this, but on Cain, his offering, he did not look with favor. And that offends our flesh. Why did God not look with favor on Cain's sacrifice? And here's why. Genesis 4, 3 and 4, verse 8. When, the time, uh, when, it came, when it was time for harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. But Abel also brought a gift, the best of his firstborn lambs, from his flock. Now therein lies the difference. Cain brought some, Abel brought his best. There are ways that you and I are to approach God uh, and, and what we are to offer to God. Abel honored it and Cain didn't. Abel sacrificed something. He, he took what was the best. He took what was first. He took the first fruits and gave that to God. And Cain said, well, let me get something. This ought to be enough. Here, God, be happy. I came to church. True worship always addresses our heart. It always addresses sin. It always addresses forgiveness. It always addresses the presence of God, you know, in our lives. And so why, why do you go to church? Do you go to see your friends? Do you go to, to, uh, to uh, hey, just learn more? Uh, do you go because you like the music? Do you go so you can meet somebody and have lunch afterwards? You know, our, our worship the reason we worship ought to be all centered on Jesus because he's the sin bearer in our stead. It says this, far too many people today in church, um, or far too many people today go to church like they're going to a club or community center. Rarely, if at all, do they show any um, conviction of sin and its impact on their lives. And uh, there is virtually no recognition for the need of forgiveness in their lives. But when people come to church with that mindset, without a heart centered on the atonement of Christ for their forgiveness of sins, God has not obligated himself to receive their prayers or their worship. If they're not coming to church on God's terms, they may have well stayed home. God won't accept their worship. Church is not a club. It is an engagement with God made possible through Christ. So when I come to church, it is a moment that Jesus, because of the cross, has created an opportunity for me to come into the very presence of God. And I should never be able to do that without searching my heart. I should never be able to do that with saying, God, is there anything in me that needs healed or corrected 
or forgiven or to be forgiving. Abel gave his best and Cain gave from what was lying around that day. I want to ask you this. Do you pray for just whatever from God? When you ask God for something, you say, God, if you could just bring me mediocre is fine. Just bring me a mediocre miracle. Uh, is that how you pray? Don't you pray for his best? Uh, don't you pray for his will and his plan and his favor and his blessing? You don't pray for leftovers from God. You, you, you don't pray that way. So why would we want to bring leftovers to God? Leftover worship isn't worship. It's like trying to pour your heart out to a friend who's sitting there the whole time you're talking, scrolling on their phone. And they keep looking up going, what was that? What are you, what are you saying? How would you feel? You're not getting their best. You know they haven't given your best. So listen, around your homes, around our homes, sometimes we have left overnight. Now, and you know what that's like. You cook something on Monday, cook something on Tuesday, and you kind of Wednesday night, you say, hey, listen, guys, we're not going to cook. We're just going to eat what we got, and we're going to clean out some things. And I don't mind left overnight. You just pull it out, you reheat it, and you eat what you got. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you invited your favorite politician, if you invited a movie star, if you invited somebody who was very important and very precious to you over to your house, I don't think you would do that. Uh, I don't imagine... Uh, you inviting Mr. President to your house and he shows up at your door and you open up and come on in, have a seat, Mr. President. And uh, listen, I've got some lasagna from Sunday night and I got some hamburger helper from Tuesday night. What can I heat up for you? Uh, I don't think that would be the conversation because if you had something that you valued, presents you were valuing, I think you would do your best. You want them to feel welcome. You want them to feel honored. You want them to feel you know, elevated and you would bring your best to that moment. You would bring your best to that person. And I think God requires the same. God asks the same. Why would I give God leftovers instead of giving God my best? Because I pray to God for his I don't want God to be like, yeah, Wes, just take this and be happy. I want God to say, I'm going to give you the best for your life, Wes. I'm going to be the best for your life, Wes. So why would I give him anything else? Uh, Malachi 1 through 7, or chapter 1, rather, 7 through 10 says this. You have shown contempt by offering defiled sacrifices on my altar. Then you ask, how have we defiled the sacrifices? You defile them by saving the altar of the Lord deserves no respect. When you give blind animals a sacrifice, isn't that wrong? Isn't it wrong to offer animals that are crippled and diseased? Try giving gifts like that to your governor and see how pleased he is, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Go ahead and beg God to be merciful uh, to you. And then when you bring that kind of offering, why should he show you any favor at all? Ask the Lord of heaven's armies. How I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that these worthless sacrifices could not be offered. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord of heaven's armies, and I will not accept your offerings. That's big. God says, when I come in and I sent my best for you, when I sent my only begotten son for you to go and walk among you and heal your sick and help the blind to see and the deaf to hear and lay his life down, shed his blood, have his body broken so that you could have freedom, so that you and I could have right relationship and you could worship me and I could be with you and that's what I love and that's why he came and that's why he died and then you come into my presence and just bring whatever and say, why isn't that good enough? I think God's calling us to more. I think God's calling us to deeper. And this, this topic of Abel uh, is too much for just one Wednesday. And so we're gonna revisit this next Wednesday and come back together and finish this journey. I did not wanna rush it tonight, so we're gonna stay on this focus. But I wanna leave you simply with this thought. Do I prioritize God in my life. When it's time to worship, do I am I focused on God? When it's time for the word, am I focused on the word? Am I giving God my best? Because I certainly want God's best for my life. So leftover time and leftover energy and leftover praise. This week, this week, I want to bring you my best, God. I want to give you my best, God. I don't want to check the box. I was there. I want to touch the hem of your garment, and I want to be in right relationship with you. I promise you, start praying that. 
You pray that for the rest of this week and model that in your life and watch what God will do. I'm excited. First Assembly, I love you. I believe in you. And I think the best is yet to come. A couple of things coming up. Um, October the 10th, we have our Mission Sunday. Uh, we're going to have a bunch of missionaries here. And we're going to have opportunity to love on them, pray with them. And after service, uh, we're going to hear from Rod, we're going to hear from Rodney Stein, missionary of the Philippines. It's going to be a beautiful time. Then we're going to have a luncheon downstairs. And so there's limited seating. So please make sure you sign up and uh, get your name on the list. And that following Wednesday, October the 13th, uh, we're having Craving Culture, and I want to encourage all of you, be a part of that. Come out that night, and uh, we would love to have you bring a dish, and we're just going to highlight foods from all over the world and have a great time. Our focus is going to be on Speed the Light. Uh, we're going to receive a Speed the Light offering that night, and I would ask you to pray and come prepared to give. Uh, what Speed the Light does is it provides transportation to our ministries, and uh, we've bought yaks for Speed the Light, cars for Speed the Light, boats for Speed the Light, bikes for Speed the Light. I mean, it helps literally carry the gospel. And so please come that night prepared to give and please come that night prepared to uh, be touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. First Assembly, I love you, I believe in you, and I believe the best is yet to come. So tell somebody about Jesus.